my enormous pleasure today to introduce Dr. Becca Franks to you. So uh, Becca got her PhD in the psychology department of Columbia University, where she also worked as a stats consultant. <laughs> I know, it's pretty amazing. Um, after a couple of uh, bits of postdoctoral work there, she won a highly prestigious Kian Fellowship to work in UBC for a few years, where she really began to pursue her main love, which is fish welfare research. Um, and since that fellowship ended, she's returned to New York, where she's a visiting assistant professor at Columbia University um, in the environmental studies department. And there she's been really successful at attracting some weird and wonderful grants. So she's attracted <laughs> money from uh, Silicon Valley, Valley billionaires and the Department of Defense. So how is that for creative funding? I've been writing notes actually as I make her CV. Um, and she's also been a phenomenally productive publisher. So she's only seven years postdoctoral, but she's got 39 publications. Yep, write that down, people. That's pretty amazing, too. So those are the official reasons why we invited her today. I should say the unofficial reason is that uh, after her talk at the ISE last summer, all my graduate students turned to me with massive eyes and they said, oh my god, we love her. <laughs> so that's another reason why we've got Becca here as well today. So without further ado, Becca's going to talk to us about positive welfare and Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, a little intimidated now. <laughs> but uh, it's so nice to be here. Um, it's my first time in Guelph, and I really have been enjoying what I've seen, and the fish fa facility tour that we took this morning uh, was fantastic. Um, yeah, so I'm just really excited to be here. Um, can you hear me okay? Is it? Okay. So I want to talk about some of the things that I've been thinking about and trying to collect some preliminary data on related to positive welfare for fish um, and the rationale for why we would want to think about something like that and uh, coming up with ideas about creating paths for ways forward. Um, for the sake of time, um, I'm going to take it as a given and or assume that you can get on board with these ideas more or less and we can talk about them more afterwards. But first, that um, knowing that fish are being used at a higher rate across multiple areas of human activity than terrestrial animals, so farming, science, uh, in homes. Um, second, that as vertebrates, at least some thought uh, about their welfare is warranted, even though there's outstanding questions regarding how much sentience different species of fish may have. And that science has some role to play in determining what sorts of treatments should be sanctioned. So those are just sort of background assumptions that we can come back to um, as you uh, are interested in. So reflecting that interest in science, if you do a search on Web of Science for Fish Welfare publications, you can see that there's been this massive uptick since about 2000, so we're gaining much more science about fish welfare. Um, but thinking about positive welfare uh, in terms of a rationale, there's just a basic science gap here. There's very little known about positive welfare for fish. Um, so we can support that actually with a bibliometric study or a systematic review that we recently um, completed. Um, so what we did is we searched Web of Science for fish welfare related phrases, uh, fish enrichment, that sort of thing, in the topic field and we restricted it for the last 10 years and that yielded um, almost 900 papers. And then we coded those titles and abstracts of those papers um, for is this study actually about fin fish? Sometimes it's literally about something else and it got pulled up anyway. Um, is the study empirical? So we're looking on did they actually collect data uh, or is it just a review article or an opinion piece talking about the concept of fish welfare? And then is the study about welfare? And we used an incredibly loose uh, uh, criteria for that. The main reason for even having that in there is that sometimes you'll have studies about fish uh, that are empirical to improve human welfare and just sort of saying that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about basically animal welfare. Um, and that uh, restricted the number of papers for analysis to 487. So almost 500 papers. So then we further coded the abstracts um, for whether or not they dealt with positive welfare, which we uh, simply defined as just was it 
studying or manipulating, talking about in any way, states beyond neutral survival. Um, negative welfare, which were studies that were about introducing or alleviating detrimental states that would be harmful to the animal. We also looked at far the setting, whether it was a farm study or a lab study, species, the, whether or not they measured or manipulated physiology, whether or not they measured manipulated affective states, motivation, or cognition, the naturalness, whether or not they were using natural living or natural behavior as something to inspire manipulation or measurement. Productivity, were they framing welfare as a production value rather than an inherent good? And also, was it invasive, in which we just defined, was there any evidence that tissue was punctured during the study? And we had two different coders, and we had good uh, agreement and a high kappa, um, so we had good reliability in terms of um, talking about that these definitions were producing the same scores with two different people. Um, and just for this talk, though, I just want to highlight positive welfare and negative welfare, and I can talk to you about the other things if you're interested at the end during questions. Um, and just very straightforwardly, just looking at the number of publications, whether or not they studied positive welfare, yes or no. And as you can see here, basically very few studies actually studied positive welfare, and the same was not true for negative welfare. Most studies were studying something that fell into the negative welfare category. So we're clearly having just a basic science information gap here. Uh, that there's just not a lot of information out there on positive welfare. So if we were to study positive welfare, we would be contributing to our understanding of you know, uh, the world in just a very basic science way. There's information out there to be gained. So that's you know, on the surface just a fact. But then you could ask, well, maybe you know, that imbalance that you're seeing here with negative welfare being studied more than positive welfare um, you know, the, focusing on this end of the spectrum of welfare, maybe that's, that should, maybe the, the, the graph should look like this. We should be investing more resources, more energy, more thought, more scholarship into studying negative welfare. And there'd be various reasons that you could make that argument. So one would be sort of a philosophical reason, which it has been discussed to various extents, but maybe most accentuated by Karl Popper, saying that the moral weight of negative experiences and negativity in, in a, a living being's life is greater than the moral weight of positive experiences. So that negative things matter more, they need to be addressed, they're more pressing. So we should be studying negative more than positive. There's also a negativity bias that's well recognized in human psychology that strong uh, that, that negative emotions or bad emotions are stronger, they're more impactful, they stay with you longer than good emotions, so they really in some sense are more imp important. And then of course there's also the Nobel Prize winning work by Kahneman and Tversky on prospect theories that says that you know, humans see losses as being more important, changes in losses are more important, more salient, worth more to people than changes in terms of positive value. So really, all of this is looking like it's much more important. Uh, negative and understanding negative welfare is more important. So I think it's still debatable whether or not that that should be the case. But even if we accept that it is the case, that the negative matters more, um, achieving the end of eliminating negative um, is actually an empirical question. It's not something that you know, we can discuss sort of from a philosophical point of view or what, what should be. But just basically, is it efficient or even possible to reach a sort of adequate, acceptable, average, neutral welfare simply through understanding and alleviating negative experiences alone? Um, so that really becomes the issue. Even if you're going to accept that ne negative welfare matters more than positive welfare, if we just focus on negative welfare, will we even get to the point of alleviating it? And basically, uh, the evidence across the animal kingdom is that that's not the case. So this probably came up first with human psychology um, and empirical work that's been demonstrated around the world and across cultures. But basically, the average person reporting an average life has more positive experiences than negative. And this, in a way, makes sense almost because negative experiences way heavier that you need more positive experiences to balance them out to reach some sort of neutral uh, average state. Um, so day-to-day -day experiences, we have more positive experiences than negative, even if we're just talking about the average person. 
And this was sort of really put, put a pin in it with um, positive psychology and the idea that a life without positive experience is not merely a neutral life, it's a bad life. It actually is bad if we don't have positive experiences. And of course we see this in the animal welfare literature as well with recent work coming out on boredom and agency that if you just remove negative and keep animals in a perpetual state where not a lot is happening, negative or positive, you can actually gradually get into states of boredom which can gradually potentially become severely aversive and problematic. Um, they certainly do with humans and um, there's a push now to understand that in animals as well. And this idea of agency that animals want to take action and engage in the world um, and that that's important to them as well. And I think probably the zoo and aquaria literature um, is a really good example of this as well because they don't have the same constraints that a lot of the rest of us do when we're studying animals where they can afford to have it be a priority to have more than basic welfare be what they're aiming for and they've been having this priority for years with environmental enrichment programs and yet you know we haven't solved this problem and I think for me the more I've thought about it is that it's just really hard to figure out how to entertain animals and if you think about it maybe from again a human perspective you know there's entire industries devoted to developing games for human beings and this is something that is thought to require a lot of thought and some games are successful, some games aren't successful. We don't know ahead of time what people, I mean, we have some sense but we don't have perfect predictive ability even with ourselves about what people are gonna wanna do um, as sort of a way of enjoying and, and spending some time in a pleasurable way. So it's actually a really hard question to answer. Um, so not only is it potentially necessary question to ask even if we're just focused on alleviating negative states it also is something that might actually be trickier to figure out so in a lot of senses maybe we do need to be focusing more on the positive end of the thing of the scale in addition to the work that we're already doing focusing on alleviating the negatives so the way that I like to think of this is that you know we we kind of might have an inclination to treat positive welfare. This is something we'll get to when we figure everything else out. This is something that's a luxury that will come later once we've like sort of cleaned up the, the mess that we have currently. And it's this luxury thing that, you know, well, if we want to and we get to it, that's great, but like, you know. And then also maybe something that we feel very proud of ourselves that, oh, look at us doing positive welfare and aren't we great. Um, but, you know, it's really maybe for lots of different reasons shouldn't be thought of that way and that actually it is sort of core and central to understanding even if we still prioritize negative welfare over positive welfare, it's part of the picture. And so perhaps most radically, um, one of the things that has been put forth in the human psychology world um, is sort of encapsulated by this quote here that psychological traits and processes are not inherently positive or negative. Instead, whether a psychological characteristic promotes or undermines well-being depends on the context in which they operate. If true, this principle indicates that we need to think beyond positive psychology. So now that positive psychology has been called out as something to do, people within positive psychology are saying, and now we need to like move on from that and stop calling things positive psychology and negative psychology. And so that this idea of there being a spectrum that's valenced um, is potentially complicating and interfering with our ability to think through things. So there is you know, this argument out there that is granted more radical than where we're at right now, but I think at least worth having on our radar that the psychologists are starting to talk about that there's no positive psychology versus negative psychology, there's just psychology. So that maybe this idea that like, maybe this idea of positive versus what negative welfare doesn't exist. So to go into that like a little bit more, um, you know, we do have some evidence of similar things and we actually know this really well in animal behavior and animal welfare. Um, the valence of things and experiences is always conditional, right? So rat pups provides a, just my favorite example, I guess, because you know, there's studies that show that rat mums are so motivated to get to their pups, and this is, of course makes a lot of sense. But there's also studies that show that rat moms are really motivated to get away from their pups, which of course also makes sense. Um, and uh, you know, we know this about preferred foods and even experiences. So sometimes feeling hunger is thought of as being an aversive experience that you try to alleviate. But if you've ever gone on vacation and overindulged, 
you might have had the experience of saying like, it would be great to actually feel hungry. <laughs> I would look forward to that experience and it would feel good to feel hungry. Um, and of course the classic example of work being um, from a behavioral economics perspective, by definition, as something that's aversive that, pe that people and other animals don't want to do, but then we have evidence of contra freeloading where animals are actually going out of their way to engage in work behavior. Um, so, so valence is conditional. Um, and this idea of good and bad, if, it, if, if we just, let's just run with this for a second, even if we decide to reject it later, the idea that good and bad is really just ethics, these valence ends of the scale are, are not uh, platonic kinds, they're not natural kinds, then what I'm doing or what I think we're doing as a group when we talk about positive welfare is more accurately by identifying that there have been experiences and things that have been systematically neglected by traditional animal welfare science and this is a way of re uh, uh, incorporating those uh, that full range into the conversation. And there's even some philosophers who make the argument that really what matters is specifically this diversity of experience and diversity of capacity. Um, and so maybe that is actually the goal, is this diversity and understanding the full diversity and the conditionalities and everything uh, that comes with that. Um, and then at a minimum, if we do that, it at least gives us a richer um, set of data to work with to have conversations and debates about welfare going forward. So at the risk of having complicated that too much, I'll just sort of recap. Um, so thinking about the positive end of the scale, if it exists, at a minimum, there's a basic science contribution that we just don't know that much. Secondly, even if we think negative is more important, understanding the positive side of things might be necessary. And that uh, studying the positive side of things might be a way of identifying what we're missing and it allows us to look for areas to have a more complete um, conversation and a less biased perspective on who animals are and what they're capable of. So if we're talking about all of that and applying that to fish, uh, where, where to start? So I mean I think that there's lots of different places to start and I'll just tell you where we have started. Um, so one of the things that I've really become very interested in is uh, focusing on this full range of possible behaviors and capabilities um, and, and focusing on that as being in and of itself something that's interesting and important. Um, and what that means is having diverse and complex environments as the baseline, um, often using life in the wild as a design guide to understand what sort of elements to incorporate um, and put the animals first and rather than you know understanding that uh, you know in the in a more applied approach to animal welfare it's very important to understand what could actually be implemented in the system so you have to start with the system but I think if we're talking about capabilities and uh, complexity and possibilities um, we need to put the constraints of the system second and not use that as a starting place um, and instead think about the animals and where they're coming from first and um, then observe behavior test what else we might be missing on top of whatever design elements that we came up that were inspired from the wild and or what might be aversive that we got wrong um, and then just use this as a starting place that this isn't going to produce uh, you know uh, watertight experiments that answer all the questions. This is a new starting place in feeling our way into sort of a darkened room uh, and, and but that it hopefully sheds some light that then can inspire future inspir experimental work that's more controlled. And then I think embracing rather than trying to um, slide by the conditionalities and I think one of the main things that you have to conclude from recognizing that you know I should put a conditionality in front of the statement, but that the conditionalities are always present, so they're probably not always present, but um, to the extent to which they're pervasive, that really what might core, be at the core of what matters is having the ability to learn about your preferences, learn about different opportunities, and then have choice about what to expose yourself to. And that really the task is to find out what are th important choices and what are important learning opportunities that animals want to have.
So some of the work, so I want to talk about um, basically a, some of the work that we did at UBC and then just very briefly uh, some work that I'm currently doing uh, based on YouTube studies. Um, and I just should keep my eye on the time. What time do, do I have until? Uh, Okay, so like if I stop at quarter after, then, then we'll have, okay, yeah, that's no problem. Um, okay, so this was our setup. Uh, this is where we started. Uh, we didn't have any uh, uh, experimental tanks here. They're just all the fish were housed the same way. Um, and we had six tanks of about 10 fish per tank, mixed sex. Uh, they're 29 gallon tanks. They were on a roughly 12 uh, hour uh, light dark cycle. We were checking water quality, feeding them. Uh, flake food in the morning and mosquito larvae in the afternoon, and we checked their welfare when we fed them. And um, what I want to talk to you about is just, we did some other things as well, but um, I just want to talk to you about some of the behavioral repertoire that we saw that hadn't been documented uh, elsewhere in the zebrafish literature. And, uh, you know, coming back to the first slide that I had, zebrafish are now one of the most studied organisms in bioscience, biomedical science. So they're, they're well known, but you know, we had this little setup uh, and actually noticed some behaviors that I couldn't find evidence of, at least um, being reported elsewhere, um, in comparison to how they're normally ho housed, which is typically in smaller tanks um, with uh, nothing in them except for a lot of zebrafish, basically. Um, so in our tanks, the baseline behavior looked like this, with the fish sort of um, roughly s uh, spread out across the whole tank, uh, keeping their distance from each other and maintaining that distance with little chases and charges, uh, little instances of agonism. And, uh, you know, if you walked into the lab at any given time, this is what you would see um, uh, almost certainly. This was the majority of how they spent their time. Um, so, as I indicated uh, uh, in terms of my approach, what I wanted to do was sort of house them this way and then ask what else might, be, might we be missing. And so the thing that I was really interested in and I continue to be interested in is the role that cognitive stimulation plays, um, you know, over and above, uh, you know, uh, material objects that you have in the environment. How does you know the role of the you know psychological mental stimulation play? So so we wanted to give them these learning opportunities and then compare how the learning opportunities affected their behavior before, after, etc. So this was sort of like the whole scope of it. But the first thing that we had to do was figure out um, uh, what they could learn, what they might want to learn about. And I should mention that of course Courtney was instrumental throughout all of this. Um, so uh, Courtney and I were. Uh, just doing with a pilot tank that wasn't going to be an experimental tank, just the tank that we were sort of like trying things out on ideas. And this was like towards the beginning. I think the fish had only been there for about a month uh, or less. And we were sort of like, oh, maybe we'll flash a light and give them like really yummy food. I honestly can't even remember exactly what we were doing, but like it did involve some training and some like food that they hadn't experienced that they were learning about with like the flash indicated that or anyway. So they had this joint learning experience. And after that happened, so just keep in mind what the baseline behavior looked like. Uh, so we finished up, we were wrapping up and they sort of came to the front of the tank and were doing you know, that back and forth behavior. And then all of a sudden they broke out into essentially this highly polarized school, uh, schooling behavior where they're all uh, facing in the same direction they're going through the tank together and navigating it in this very like dramatically different way than their normal behavior. And they kept this up for I think about 45 minutes. Um, so we were pretty blown away by this and just thought it was really like incredible if, we, if, if, this, if we could get this kind of dramatic behavioral change just with this learning thing. Unfortunately, we weren't able to replicate it again and I have some ideas about why that is. Um, but I think that it's just, I'm fascinated by the fact that the, apparently zebrafish have this in them. And you know, what produces that? What it was that we did that led them to behave in this radically different way? Um, and I guess I'll mention this. Um, I wasn't going to, but 
Yeah, I talked to a guy who spent some time in, uh, in India watching zebrafish, and the way he described their behavior is basically this is what it, to, I mean, you know, so it's an anecdote, but this is, and I didn't lead him into it, this is just what he told me, and I was like, interesting. So um, I don't have anything else to say about that except for that I'm really intrigued. Um, another behavior that uh, we noticed that we were very intrigued by, um, we were able to do more systematic work on, and we've termed it, we've since termed it heightened shoaling, and it's this. Um, and so again, uh, it's, it's discrete, it's qualitatively different, it's sort of like it's either happening or it's not happening, and it's pretty clear. And so the idea was we wanted to document how often it happened and what was going on and sort of evaluate how it might map on to other um, sorts of similar looking behavior in other species. And we recently published this in uh, the journal Animals. Um, so for this, uh, we wanted to document it and evaluate its characteristics, its parameters, and sort of start to think about its consistency with positive versus negative experience. So, um, you know, here I'm assuming that the fish are having an experience, and I want to know, is it more likely to be positive or more likely to be negative? And I understand that other people might not want to make that assumption, and we can talk about that as well. Um, so, uh, if it's more consistent with positive, you know, the idea is that we would see no signs of negative affect, which in zebrafish look like erratic swimming, aggression, and diving behavior. They go to the bottom of the tank. Uh, that it's uh, spontaneous, it's not reactive uh, to some sort of like potential threat. Uh, it's synchronous and it's protracted, which would indicate some sort of self-reinforcing property and that there's high participation rates, which would indicate that it's also attractive um, to fish in general, the fish in the tank in general. So the way we did this um, was we did scan sampling where we just looked at a little uh, clips of, of uh, video and then also all, all occurrence sampling looking at the whole uh, day across multiple tanks. So for the scan sampling we wanted to compare to baseline um, behavior, non heightened shoaling behavior and uh, pre-feed behavior. And so we selected four days. Um, from four days we uh, made a hundred second video clips, uh, nine of those within heightened shoaling, shoaling episodes. Uh, 18 within baseline and 18 pre-feed, so we had 45 clips in total. And then for each of those 100 second clips, we took, every 10 seconds we took a snapshot and we noted down where the fish were in the tank, where they were oriented, and if there was any aggression within the next couple seconds. And then we used a generalized multi-level modeling to account for the multiple sampling at different levels of, of uh, uh, data collection. And then the all-occurrence sampling, looking at uh, 10 days, all six tanks across light cycle and just getting the timing and duration and frequency of, of heightened shoaling. So for the scan sampling, um, uh, this is, can you see the arrow? This is like a, a recapitulation of the side of the tank. So imagine you're just looking into the side of the tank. So you have the, um, the the uh, substrate here, and then this is the upper. So, and, and, the, and here we have just a little dot representing each zebrafish, and they're slightly transparent, so you can see them like darker areas mean there were more often that fish were seen there. And there's this gap here because of the slope that we had in the tanks. So, in baseline, they're basically using the entire space more or less. Pre feed looks pretty similar, except for there's a big cluster up here, which is where they got fed. And then heightened shoaling, uh, I'd note two things. One is that there's obviously, a, they're not using the whole space, they're very clumped in the same area, and it's always in the same place. It's in this middle of the slope here. So, but in terms of their location in the X, Y axis, there weren't any differences here. So they weren't any lower in the tank, um, or were they to more to the left or the right. So we could also, for each little snapshot, measure interfish distances. So bigger distance means that they were more spread out, and smaller distances mean that they were more clumped together. And uh, as you can anticipate from that, uh, the fish uh, interfish distances were much, much uh, lower during height and shoal shoaling. And in, in fact, we have essentially a non-overlapping distribution. So again, we're looking at something that's like discrete and binarily different from baseline behavior. It's not like a graded, like, oh, we're just looking at the higher end of what they're normally doing. This is uh, a distinct behavior. 
And similar to that, we also looked at the de deviation from horizontal, so the degree to which they're all adhering to the same swimming plane. And in baseline, you know, they're mostly swimming horizontally, as you would expect, but some deviations, it can't go more than 90 degrees. So once it goes to 90, then we'd start coding it back to, you know, 89 degrees. So pre-feed, same thing, and then height and shoaling, they're all engaged in a more similar swimming pattern that's uh, more uh, adherent to the horizontal. Um, and then we also saw quite a bit of this agonism uh, and the baseline that you noticed uh, in the previous video. And it went down during feeding, uh, but it went down even further during uh, height and shoaling. So aggression was quite low. Then looking at the all-occurrence sampling, um, in general, uh, it was happening uh, at a median of seven minutes. So this is a pretty protracted amount of time to be engaged in a behavior. And there were even some times where they would do it for 30 minutes. So it was really something that was, you know, long, long-term behavior state. And we saw it at all times of the day. And I think there was only one instance of all the different, oh, I should have said, and I forgot to double check, but the, we found, I think, approximately 30 instances of heightened shoaling across that sampling procedure. And there was only one case where two tanks were doing it within 10 minutes of each other. Otherwise, it was completely happening at different times within, which to me indicates that there wasn't some sort of room level event that was causing the fish to start to do something. Instead, it must be driven by internal tank dynamics. So we find these, these signals uh, that it's at least consistent. Um, it's, not, it's not looking consistent with negative affect and potentially consistent with positive affect. OK, so this is another uh, anecdote. Uh, so uh, another thing that we saw that I would just love to follow up with, um, but I don't have zebrafish anymore, so I, I'm not going to do it. But maybe somebody else or friend of friend um, is uh, zebrafish are not thought to be nesting species. They are thought to spawn in the morning over gravel if it's available, and they have a, a, a dance that they, a, you know, a, a way of interact. Male and female uh, swim around each other in a particular way and. Uh, quiver at each other. And then there's also some uh, aggression involved of like choosing spawning sites, who's going to go there, who's not going to go there. And so it's thought to be a sort of a time of like a lot of activity and potentially a lot of aggression. And in our tanks, uh, we started seeing in, and then we adopted out the fish as well. So this went to people's homes. And this happened in different homes as well. Um, that they were engaging in this behavior uh, in the morning when they should have been spawning. So they had dug out a little cavity under this fake plant. And uh, I would like to note, A, that there's almost no aggression. They're all on top of each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I obviously have no, I don't know what they were doing. We didn't do any, we didn't collect any data on this. But I think it's really interesting that if part of the reason that we don't think that they're a nesting species is because they just were never given the opportunity to have nesting material. Um, because we don't know a lot about their behavior in the wild because there have been some really interesting, great work done on zebrafish in the wild, but the, the conditions are quite demanding. And they're not typically housed like this in laboratories. So um, I think, again, it's something I'm very intrigued by, but I don't have much more than just an in intriguing uh, nugget for you. So I think that what this means to me, at least, is that we have this notion of what baseline behavior is. And uh, it, you know, maybe, maybe we don't know what baseline behavior is, especially, and I think this is especially true for fish. Uh, you know, collectively, as a species, we don't spend a lot of time underwater. So we don't actually have sort of, we're not bringing to the table a lot of knowledge about what fish behavior should look like. They're also so anatomically different from us that you know, we don't have the same, you know, like uh, facial expressions of emotion are highly conserved across mammals. Um, so we can recognize facial expressions in other animals. And one of the things you hear about fish all the time is that they don't have facial expressions, which of course is not true. They do have facial expressions. They're just very different than ours. They go like that. Um, 
So, you know, we don't tend to do that. They, people think it's silly when I do that, but, you know, that's what fish do. Um, okay. So, just in the last little bit, um, show you some more videos. So, uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now um, is uh, YouTube as a source of animal behavior data has become something that people are getting more and more interested in. There's actually several published papers now out there about people doing this. Um, and even some neat work comparing what conclusions you'd make if you used YouTube versus actually field work. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's one of those like, oh, this thing has happened and now there's this new source of data out there and how can we wrap our heads around this? So I had this idea of this might be a good place to turn to to look at fish play. Um, there has been a lot of anecdotal evidence for a long time about fish engaging in play behavior. There's a handful of studies, like I'd say definitely less than five, maybe as little as two or three, um, really looking at potential behaviors as fish play. But it's the kind of thing that if people see, it seems like something they'd want to video and then put on YouTube. So maybe this would be a good place to turn to find examples of uh, fish play. So um, I'm thinking about this in terms of positive welfare from a diversity and capacities connection, not from wanting to make strong claims about affect, which obviously I, we don't want to do. Um, at this point in terms of how well we understand play, is, is, uh, we're not there yet. Um, so our methods were pretty much what you'd expect. We searched YouTube for fish play and variants of that term. We built a database of potential fish play candidates we're continuing to build that. So if you have any videos that you know of, please send them my way. And then we coded the videos to the best of our ability according to some of Burkhardt's criteria, which is that it looks non-functional, it looks like it's done for its own sake, it's altered from what you would normally expect to see, and that it's being done in a relaxed field. So there was one video of somebody saying, look at this fish playing with a cat. And there was literally a cat in a bathtub with a fish, and the cat was like hitting the fish. So. That didn't count as a relaxed field. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know, it was cat play. Anyway, I mean, the fish was moving, but the fish didn't have any, I don't know, anyway. So um, we also looked at some other dimensions, like the play type, the evidence if there was training, the setting in which it happened, was it inside or outside, that sort of thing. So I just want to show you some examples of the videos that we turned up. So th this is um, one of the ones that I like because this is as close as you're going to get to a little experiment in YouTube. So you, this guy, um, I, don't, I think the notes say that he put this in because he wanted to give his fish something to do, which is happening more and more, actually. Even just since I started this study a few months ago, there's like fish boredom toys now. So I think he's put this in because he noticed that his fish like doing it. And so he shows you what they're doing before this little device that he created is turned on. And then it's creating this bubble stream. And then, um, then you know, later how the fish are engaging in it and sort of like throwing themselves into the stream and um, swimming up against it and sort of, uh, you know, and part of the problem is, of course, is that we're saying this is like altered behavior. And if we don't know what the normal behavior is, uh, it's hard to know if it's altered or not. But, you know, as I'm watching fish more and more and more, it's becoming more clear what's altered and what's not. So it's, you know, um, it, there's work to do on that end of things as well. So this bubble stream thing turned to be very fruitful. Uh, so here's one that uh, is a beta fish. And this one goes on for a really long time. I tried to get the ones that like, are just the most clear um, instances. This fish was doing this quite a bit. But like, he's trying to, it looks like searching out a, you know, places in the stream where he's really getting shot up quick. <laughs> and then swimming away. And then, oh, that was a good one. Um, yep. <laughs> um, and then also uh, some documentation of this occurring in the wild even. So this one, um, I did, I'm like trying to get the video recorded on my screen and then from YouTube. So it's not, it's not the best, this one. But um, this fish is basically, and this goes on for a while, where every time the d diver exhales, the fish swims over and uh, tries to get into the bubble stream. Um, then there's these parrot fish that um, really are sort of the stars of our YouTube study. 
Um, they do a lot of different things, and, and this one is just, um, I, I love this video. There's so many things that I see in this video. He, he's quite concerned about this fish. Every time that fish comes over, he kind of stops what he's doing. Um, and again, maybe this is functional, but I would say, you know, there's things that this fish is doing that are sort of like look a lot like self-handicapping, like right now. Um, <laughs> which is what you see in play uh, in other species and one of the hallmarks of play. Um, and yeah, so he's... Yeah. yeah. So there's that guy. And then I have a video, as my last video, of another parrotfish, and this is... Um, this is a very popular video on YouTube now. I think it's been watched more than three million times. The other ones are like, it's like me and someone else. <laughs> but this one, other people have seen this one. And this one is, again, this is much longer, but this is my favorite part of this. And so this is this fish, and the guy writes that, 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 that this fish loves playing with him, and that when he comes home, this fish does this dance to get his attention to come and play with him, and um, just, you know, they have uh, this this relationship of you know the to me. Now that I've looked at this, it just you know this looks like a a puppy. So playing playing with a non-con specific. It's like oh where'd you go? Yeah. Okay. So final thoughts. Um, some species of fish, at least, are more complex than we typically assume, I think. Some take-homes that I'd like you to have. If sharks are fish, we're phylogenetically speaking, all fish. So this isn't just a story about fish. Um, we have these negativity biases that are driving research across the animal kingdom, including human research. So this is not particular to fish. Um, and I think that positive welfare is an urgent need for us to understand all of welfare. I think it has a, play to, a role to play and that there's a lot of catching up to do, and I hope that uh, you know, some of you will join me in uh, pursuing this research going forward. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank uh, my current master's student, Isabel, and Jennifer Jacquette, Luke Stunts, who helped me collect data. Courtney was instrumental for all of the zebrafish work, and uh, my advisors from UBC, Nina and Dan. Thank you. Yeah, so um, interesting and controversial. And uh, do fish really play or uh, not? Yes? Am I crazy? Well, that's, we can take that as a given. That's fine. So, questions from the audience? Yeah, I Oh, really? Yeah, the, the diver system goes down. Oh. And then like, you have them, they come like, super close to the same water. Yeah. They all have the same, but um, <laughs> like, you would have them like, go and like, break your hand, you would just like, circle tricks. Oh, great. So, whatever, like, okay, well, I'll definitely have to track, I'm going to get my things, notes to track that down for sure. Yeah, uh, so th there's a great book called What a Fish Knows by Jonathan Balcom, and he's got a lot of anecdotal evidence about uh, similar things. It, it seems like groupers do this a lot, um, where there'll be divers that go back and know a, a particular grouper, and the grouper knows them, and they have, like, you know, even in the wild, uh, some ability to form a real, and, and groupers apparently are very, very curious about human divers and uh, can be quite pesky in terms of like picking at your gear and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So there, um, there, that's exactly what I would want to do as a follow-up, right? So one of the things that's possible is that they're, um, you know, trying to get more oxygen if it's like an oxygen oxygen bubbler or something like that. So um, Gordon Burghardt write, writes about fish play in his book, um, The Genesis of Animal Play, and he, I think, informally tested the oxygen hypothesis by um, also bubbling inert gas. So like, I can't remember what kind of inert gas it was, but basically something that's you know going to bubble but not going to have any sort of like interaction with the, the fish physiology. And they still did it just as much. Um, but again, it's an anecdote. And um, uh, so one of the, yeah, so one of the things is, is just to sort of say, this is like qualified, but potentially promising, especially because we see it so much. So another potential fish play behavior that you hear a lot about is the jumping over sticks. And there has actually been some published work on it, but it was done in like the 40s, so it's a little bit <laughs> like they don't have the same sort of like standards that we have about methodology reporting <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, uh, but we haven't able, been able to find anything about fish jumping over. We found one thing where all these minnow were jumping over a, fit, a stick. But that, that was just one compared to all of these bubble videos. Like, there's just tons of bubble videos. Well, not tons, but there's, it's been fruitful. So yeah, no, I think we need to start investigating that kind of stuff exactly. Great question. Yeah, so the question was, were there any generally accepted um, understandings of the purpose of the sh uh, heightened shoaling behavior? So um, we couldn't find anybody else talking about zebrafish doing this. And I've talked to a lot of zebrafish uh, people who've been working with them much longer than I did. Um, and they speculated that maybe it has something to do with communication because they have uh, you know, ability to like have chemo uh, receptors and communicate through chemicals. Um, so maybe the proximity facilitated that sort of communication. Um, and then in terms of shoaling in the wild, you know, it can help with pretty much everything. So, but, I, but this isn't, a shoal is sort of generally thought of as like a loose affiliation of fish in a similar area that kind of stick together. And that's why we wanted to use a different term for it because this is really, they're really clumped in a different sort of way. Um, and as far as that goes, I haven't read about that uh, in, in another species. So again, very open question. I don't have a lot of answers. I just have a lot of questions at this point. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question, I think, for all animal welfare research. Um, so I think, um, I think, you know, my main answer is that I think I'm starting to less and less believe in things having static positive versus negative value. And so I think that, that this, like, taking this conditionality approach and, and means to me providing animals with choice and control so that, and, and you know, we, are, we and other animals are not necessarily uh, good decision makers in the sense that we decide to do things that make us happy all the time. And that's true for animals too. But um, I think that the, the ability to have choice um, and autonomy, especially for animals that are living under such tightly controlled conditions, reintroducing some choice to me seems like a very important uh, goal. So I would say what I'd be interested in more than nailing it down as being clearly positive welfare, because I, I don't think that it is, and I don't know that it ever could be shown to be, but instead saying, you know, what are the type of environments that increase it? What are the type of environments that decrease it? What type of environments at least facilitate the possibility of it versus the type of environments that make it impossible to do that? And I think you have to almost um, 
you know, I know this is controversial, but I think there is sort of an inevitable circularity in what we're doing. Um, and that, you know, if the environments look like the kind of environments that we think of as being good environments, um, and you see some consistent mapping of that onto height and shoaling, then it starts to look more like a good behavior, but then that's used to then validate other environments as being good. So I think that um, it's complicated. Yeah, but I would really be interested, nonetheless, knowing the type of environments that you know promote it and the type of environments that um, uh, completely suppress it. Yeah. Is there any work trying to explore what fish do when they're feeling good by doing bad things to them and kind of doing some kind of contrast? Yeah, there has now started being some work that's looking in the same study at you know what happens when we do s something bad versus what happens when we do something good, um, and uh, I think that you know that th that is definitely you know there's different promising ways to go, um, so, so that work is beginning basically is the short answer, but. You know, one of the things that we were just talking about also at the um, facilities today is that um, unless you're talking about general principles that could potentially apply to all animals, saying what fish do when they're happy versus when they're sad, if you can get on board with the idea that they could be happy or sad, um, is misleading because there's so many different species of fish. It would be like saying, you know, this is what a giraffe does and therefore this is what, you know, a mouse would do. So. Um, uh, so there is some some qualifiers that need to be made about like specific behaviors. But if we're talking about general principles, that's sort of what I'm interested in and sort of getting at that. And people are starting to do that work, mostly in laboratories right now. Yeah, condition place preference and stuff like that. Yeah. Thank you.